Okay, so we are in the general section. There's a slide missing there for some reason. Um, you had problems that were reported, and then you had problems, or, or rather questions, that were written um, to Paul. I don't know why that's missing. But we're right there in chapter 12, which has to do with problems, or uh, again, uh, not problems, but the epistle apparently, that the Corinthians wrote to Paul asking him various questions. And what's the phrase that is used to show that we're starting a new section, a new topic? Yeah, now concerning, and that's what you have there in verse 1, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren. Um, this section uh, begins here in chapter 12, but runs all the way through the end of chapter 14. And in chapter 15, there's a new section on um, the resurrection, the, the general resurrection, and their rejection of that, and Paul showing how that's inconsistent if they believe in the resurrection of Christ. What we'll have in chapter 12 is a lot about the gifts and their origin and their purpose in this first half, and then JT's going to cover verse 15 through the end of the chapter, Lord willing, on Sunday, and it's going to have to do a lot with unity. Um, very practical for us. If you take the spiritual gifts part out of it, uh, we need that in there to understand it, but when you take that out of it, um, there's a lot to take from this practically for us um, here at this location and, and just any local congregation. Many different members, many different parts that they play and roles that they play and things they bring to the table, and so we ought not to dishonor or despise or shame anyone but realize their value and just how God is working through them for the building up of the church. Chapter 13 is the excellent way, the more excellent way, which is really even a, just a more excellent way of edifying. And it's, it's beyond these spiritual gifts, and it's love that will edify and will be available throughout time and eternity, um, where these others will um, fail, the spiritual gifts, and then even... You've got faith and hope that will become realization um, and sight. The love will continue on. Chapter 14 deals with really the regulation of spiritual gifts. Um, love is a big part of that regulation, but in chapter 14 there is the call to order, which goes hand in hand with the um, part the spiritual gifts play that we'll talk about tonight namely the edification of the church, the revelation of God's will, and just how they were supposed to um, use them in chapter 14. So first we've got spiritual gifts, concerning spiritual gifts. So before we get into the text, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the, the groundwork that I think needs to be laid, and we'll, we'll not get too deep into it. But when did, or what are the, the spiritual gifts a product of, or I should say who? When, when it says spiritual gifts, gifts of the Spirit, who's the Spirit? The Holy Spirit, right? Um, in John 14, 15, and 16, what promise did Jesus make to his apostles? Remembering it was only the apostles that were there. That's who he was talking to. We can take some lessons from it, but what did he promise them? Yes. The Holy Spirit who comes over and says, teaching and presenters of all things, etc. Yeah. The Holy Spirit would come, the Comforter, the, the Parakletos is the word. Um, and you, you see in John chapter 14, he, he says it this way in verse um, 16, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. There's two Greek words translated another. Off the top of my head, I can't remember the exact Greek word. But one of them has to do with another of a different sort. And so um, you could have another item that's not related to the previous item. The word used here is another of the same sort. And so it's different. And so take, for example, you've got fruit. There's that class. You've got an apple, and then a banana would be another of the same sort. It's different, but it's a fruit, isn't it? And so it would be... You know, the other other would be another, but it's a carrot. It's not a fruit. And so the point Jesus is making here is that I'm going away. You, you've had a divine helper in me, the Son of God in your midst. Up to this point in time, I'm going away, but you're still going to have to do the work of an apostle. Now, that's going to be a daunting task if they're just men by themselves, isn't it? 
And so who's the other that is a representative of Jesus and would inspire them to speak the word of God, the Holy Spirit? Um, So with that in mind, what's the Holy Spirit's work going to be? What, what else is he called? The spirit of what? Of truth. That's key. The spirit of truth. In John 14 and in verse 25, uh, he says, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I have said to you. In chapter 16, he says in verse 13, When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Speaking on the authority of Christ, not on his own authority. When did this occur? When did the spirit of truth come to the apostles? Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost. Remember in Mark 9, 1, he told the crowd there, there's some of you who won't taste death till you see the kingdom of God present with power. In Luke chapter 24, He told them to tarry in Jerusalem until you were endued with power from on high. In Acts 1, he said, not many days from now, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You'll be in Jerusalem, and when the power comes upon, or the Holy Spirit comes upon you, the the power will come upon you. And then you have chapter 2. What, What was the setting there? Where were they? They're in Jerusalem. Who is in the upper room? The the apostles. Um, And so when it says that they were filled with the Spirit and began to speak with tongues, you notice in Acts chapter 2, the antecedent to they, because most commentaries you read that aren't written by brethren are going to say all of the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit because it's speaking of the 120 in Acts chapter 1. But down at the last part of Acts chapter 1, it's speaking of the apostles that are casting lots to see who would take the place of Judas Iscariot. And it says, he was numbered, that is Matthias, with the 11 apostles. And then it says, they were all with one accord in one place in Acts chapter 2. And so I said upper room, and so um, that's (laughs) maybe why you thought of the 120. That was my mistake. They were in this house. It filled the whole house. And they began to speak with tongues. So you've got the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. And we talked about how he's the spirit of truth. So he's going to reveal God's word fully. But they are men. And so obviously they're inspired, which means what? It's not them speaking, but who? The spirit, Christ through the spirit, so on and so forth. God is speaking through them. So... I could tell you right now I'm inspired. This is God speaking. How do you know that that's not true? Or how would you know that it is true? What would I have to do for you to say, okay, I believe you? Miracle. Miracle. And so that's part of the Spirit's testimony. In John chapter 15, it talked about how the apostles will testify of me, Jesus says, but the Spirit will also as well. And they're eyewitnesses, and they're speaking of their own experiences, though it is flawless and infallible, and additional information that they didn't have before is coming as they're inspired of God. And the Holy Spirit is testifying in that way, but he's testifying in the fact of these miracles validating what is being said. And so I think that's what we need to remember when we get into 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, Turn very quickly to Hebrews chapter 2, which is an excellent place. Um, to think about this, and we have that phrase, gifts of the Holy Spirit as well. Um, In Hebrews 2, he's speaking about their um, slouching toward apostasy, and he says that the word spoken through angels uh, proves steadfast. How will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? That salvation that he's talking about is through the speaking of God's word. So you have in chapter 3 in apostasy, that specifically concerns the deceitfulness of sin and sinful action um, and failure in obedience. And in chapter 2, you really have this turning away from the system, the word of, of salvation. Because it at first began to be spoken by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Who else was bearing witness? Who else was confirming? And how was God confirming? 
this word of salvation. And we know it proves steadfast. Signs, wonders, and, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Signs, wonders, various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so a sign, someone says, are all miracles signs? Yes, they are, because the miracles had a purpose. So what did the sign indicate? It signified something. This event signifies something about the message and the messenger, namely what? Authority. authority. It's coming from God, and he is not speaking on his own authority. It signified that, because this is a work that no one can do but God alone. God is doing it through them. Wonders is the effect the event has on the people who see it. And they wonder about it. It's wonderful to them, not in the way we usually use it, but it, it's, it's extraordinary. It is um, otherworldly. It transcends nature and natural law because of what the event itself was, miracles, which speaks to what? What, what would your definition of miracle be? Yes, something that can't happen naturally. And so the one working it is himself outside of nature. And so right there in those, you have gifts of the Spirit. And it's the same language that we see in chapter 12, spiritual gifts, gifts that were distributed by the Spirit. And so when we get to chapter 12, we know these are of what nature? Miraculous, right? And so these are meant to... Do two things. Reveal the truth, and then what? How do I know it's true? It is confirmed by miracles, and we'll kind of uh, make those distinctions as well. Here's something important, though. When we get down to verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 12, he speaks about by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. What baptism is that? And... Why? We could be confused about this in a context of spiritual gifts, but what baptism is that? We were all baptized, he says. There's a hint. Water baptism in the name of the Lord. He says, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, have all been made to drink into one spirit. Now, it can be confusing because we're in the middle of a context of spiritual gifts, and so the mind may directly go to Holy Spirit baptism, but we know that that can't be the case because of wine in the book of Acts 2 and 10. When are the occasions of the Holy Spirit baptism? On the day of Pentecost and with who? Cornelius and his household. On the day of Pentecost, there's the fulfillment of the promise of Christ to send the Holy Spirit. And that signified the prophecy of Joel 2 that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Salvation is here as promised for the Jews and then in chapter 10, Cornelius was who? A Gentile, right. And there in chapter 10, it showed the promise is also for the Gentiles that they are gospel subjects as well. And by the language, just study it on your own, in Acts chapter 10 and 11 with Peter, it's obvious this is not something that commonly occurred. He, he was shocked, and it, it moved him to command them to be baptized in water in the name of the Lord. And so there's a distinction there. In Acts 2.38, he talks about baptism in the name of the Lord. In Acts 10, what is verified is that baptism in the name of the Lord is not Holy Spirit baptism. It's baptism in water. So these Corinthians, though, had spiritual gifts. Chapter 1, he said, you came short in no gift. But they weren't baptized with the Holy Spirit. I mean, maybe a part of Cornelius' family went off to Corinth. I don't know. But... If they weren't there on the day of Pentecost as an apostle, which obviously they're not, and they weren't a part of Cornelius' house, they were not baptized with the Holy Spirit. So how do they have spiritual gifts? This is something we talked about before. Laying on in the hands of the apostles. Uh, there's a, an old sermon title that um, has been preached many times and from Acts 8. What Simon saw and what did he see? That through the laying on of the apostles' hands... They were given the Holy Spirit. So that's what we have right here. That's what he says is spiritual gifts. And I don't want you to be ignorant about these. And obviously there were some things that they were ignorant about. Namely, you know, this isn't for your pride. This isn't 
um, for you. It's, it's for everyone. It's God that gave it to you, so you have no reason to boast, and uh, you need to use it in such a way that would be befitting the Lord. So, first of all, in, wow, everything's way messed up, isn't it? There's a couple points under there. I sent the right deal. I don't know why it did that, so we'll just, uh, you're going to have to just listen to me extra carefully. So, point A, verse 1B, don't want you to be ignorant. Verse 2, you were Gentiles carried away and led to these dumb idols. Um, Then he says, therefore, in verse 3. So we know they have a connection. What does dumb mean? You know, when I was little, I was like, oh, those those idols are dumb. (laughs) What does it mean? They're mute. There's countless scriptures in the Old Testament where God is challenging them, and he's impressing the Israelites with how uh, ridiculous it is to turn to these idols who are mute. You might just put in your notes, Psalm 115, 4 through 7. That's a really good one. Psalm 115, verse 4 through 7. They are dumb. They're not speaking. You have a powerful contrast between the Spirit of God, who is really God. He speaks. He's been speaking. He speaks today through his completed revelation. We'll see that from chapter 13, that which is perfect is dumb. But these dumb idols, they are dumb. They are mute. They don't speak. But... Did that stop the Corinthians from being idolaters before they were Christians? No. So who's behind that? We kind of studied in chapter 10. You're not sacrificing to real gods, but who are you sacrificing to? Who's behind idolatry? Demons, Satan. And so you you read of a place like 1 Timothy chapter 4, deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. In all false doctrine... Satan is behind it, even in idolatry and all false religions. Those aren't real gods, but Satan is behind it. So it tells us something here, and and here's the reason for verse 3. You showed yourself to be gullible. You showed yourself to be uh, cheated and misled before by a god that didn't even speak. And someone was claiming to be the prophet of that god, and you believed he was inspired. But you didn't see the signs which showed that he wasn't inspired. You, you weren't verifying that he is inspired. And, and here is a very fundamental principle that applies to us today, brethren, to see whether something is of God or not. And he says this, no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And then he says, or, uh, and then he says no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. That may have been a specific problem going on. We see it in 1 John. Whoever does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And he said, test the spirit. This is how you know. We revealed to you that Jesus has come in the flesh. So when someone comes saying, I'm inspired of God, but Jesus did not really come in the flesh, what do you know about him? He's a false teacher. He's not from God. His doctrine isn't inspired. And so I believe this is a very fundamental example of a more general principle Even in the Old Testament, uh, I read from my sermon on Sunday in Deuteronomy chapter 13, a situation where there may be one trying to lead you away into idolatry, and he he has an event that he's, he's foretelling or he does something, and it comes to pass. And what God says is, that doesn't mean he's inspired. I'm testing whether you love me. And so what is the number one test for the Corinthians and us today to verify whether something is of God. The word. You go to what has already been revealed. To the extent in Galatians 1, what did Paul say? If who comes? An angel, even me, or an angel from heaven, or anyone else, and he declares to you a different gospel, let him be accursed. And you'll be accursed with him if you follow his doctrine. So you have... First of all, throughout this section, unity is key, but unity of revelation. When God reveals something, he's not going to reveal something later that contradicts what he's revealed over here. And so they need to beware about those things. And we can especially see in 2 Corinthians a problem of people who claim to be apostles. And how could you know they weren't apostles? Because they're contradicting what Paul has already revealed to him. Now you have the unity of the origin of the gifts. We know where they're from. Where are they from? Who are they from? Holy Spirit. God. Jesus. So so you've got the Spirit here. You've got the Lord, which I believe is Jesus. You've got God. And you've got the Trinity that is revealed here. 
but that they're all involved in this in some way or fashion. And what he does, so in the New King James Version, it says diversities, differences, and diversities, same Greek word, and other translations keep it the same. And what the word means is ultimately distribution. Now, it has a connotation of differences, which is obvious in this passage. But if you look at verse 11, the root of that word is used, and it's translated distributing to each one individually as he um, wills. And so there's, there's different distributions, so there's diversities. But the idea is that this is all coming from who? He is distributing it. Now, there are three distinct descriptions of what these gifts are, and gifts is one of them. And he's not talking about three different things. He's talking about, like, I would talk about myself as a man, a husband, a father, a brother, an uncle. I'm the same person, but there are different angles of who I am. And I believe that's what he's talking about here. And the first thing he says is they are of the same spirit, and what does he call them? Gifts, right? The Greek word is charisma. What, just off the top of your head, when we read the word grace in the New Testament, what is the Greek word? Do you remember? It's the Greek word charis. And so this is related to that word. And it means uh, a gift of favor. And so, I mean, just inherent within the idea of gift is that I didn't earn this. It's being given to me. And so what would this do for the Corinthians, especially as we know the context, the tongue speakers, who are acting like they're the biggest and baddest. Go to chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians. He's getting on them for boasting. And notice in verse 7 of chapter 4, Who makes you differ from one another? And what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as though you had not received it? You didn't go to the store and buy this with your hard-earned money. You certainly didn't, you know, work on your skills to be able to do this. You just were given it by the Holy Spirit. It was a gift. It takes all boasting away. And if, if he gave you tongue speaking and he gave this person over here some gift that you think is lesser somehow, so be it. That means nothing about you. He's distributing verse 11 to everyone individually as he wills. Then he calls it, Differences or distributions of what? <clears throat> Ministries, but the same Lord. Ministry just means service. It's a discharge of, of any service. Who is being served here? What are these gifts for? So the edification of the church. And so, you know, you have in this idea of the diversity of activities, but God working all in all, and the differences of gifts, but it's from the Spirit. This ministry is coming from the Lord Himself. It's not that it's talking about our service to the Lord, though that'd be true. He's serving the church. He's, he's helping the church. He's filling the church, Ephesians chapter 1, and verses 22 and 23, through these gifts. He's edifying the church. And so you've got differences of services. Not all of these have the exact same service necessarily, no more than they're the exact same gift, but it's the Lord who is administering that. And then lastly, differences or diversities of activities, which is the Greek word energima, which sounds like energy. It's from that root word where we get energy, and it's the effect of one working. He is God who works all in all. And all gifts, with all men who have those gifts, who is doing it? God. And so there goes your boasting right out the window. You have no grounds for boasting whatsoever. God is doing this, not you. Then he says in verse 7, gives purpose. So there's the, the unity of origin. There's the unity of purpose. Remember, those are different descriptions of the same thing. So you could describe them all as gifts, all as ministries, all as activities. But now you have their purpose. What's the purpose? For the profit of all. Um, it's interesting to note that Greek word, it's sumphero. It's the same word that is translated helpful in chapter 6 and verse 12. In chapter 10 and verse 23, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. He's trying to help us. 
and it's for the help, the profit, the uh, edification is what that help is of all. But notice, he says, to each one, there in verse 7, to each one for the profit of all. And so I receive a gift that differs from you, but it's for the profit of all. And they needed to understand that. It's not for your vanity. It's not for your arrogance. It's for the profit of all, which goes right along with verse thir- chapter 13. Love, that's what we do for another. Right along, along with chapter 14 when he's talking about edification. If it's, if it's not going to benefit anyone else, even if it will benefit you, it's not going to benefit anyone else, keep your mouth shut at church. You can exercise your gift at home. He talks about tongue speakers. He tells them keep silent. Uh, do not speak at church, you know, and he talks about before in that chapter that you may edify yourself, but if there's no interpretation, you're not edifying anyone else. So in the church, in the assembly, you keep silent. It's not for you. It's for everyone else, and that's what um, they needed to understand. Linsky uh, had a, a good comment that I really liked. He says that the gifts make us stewards and call for their administrations. They convert us into altruists. This obligation is only too often forgotten. That was certainly true for spiritual gifts. Anything that we can say we have from the Lord, it would be the same. Any comments, questions up to this point? I know I've been talking a lot. Okay. Um, it's for the profit of all. Now, now here's something interesting. A lot of times when we think about spiritual gifts, especially, or, or just miracles, period, and, and we think about something like the, the uh, um, gifts of healings in verse 9, Immediately, we think that God just wants everyone to be made well. You know, Jesus asked the man at the pool of Bethesda, do you want to be made well? well God wants everyone to be made well. And, and that's why he had the gifts of healings. But remember, he says in verse 7, keep in mind, every single one of these gifts, no matter what they are, they're for the profit of all. And so if you are healed, but this person over here is not healed, how is that for the profit of all? You might think that, well, if I'm healed over here, then he's going to be healed over here. Not necessarily. Um, In 2 Timothy 4 and verse 20, Paul says, Trophimus, I have left in Miletus sick. You think Paul could have healed Trophimus? But he didn't. What does that tell us about these spiritual gifts? Just because you have them doesn't mean you use it every single time it could be used. Every time you see a sick person, you heal that sick person? No. No. Every time you, you think to talk in tongues, were they supposed to talk in tongues? Could, did they have a control over that? He says in chapter 14, no, be quiet, be silent. And it's the word for total silence. You shut your mouth if there's no interpreter. And, and he says of the prophets that the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So here's my point. These have a purpose, and the purpose is greater than then what we may value, and certainly there's compassion from God in in physical healing, the the physical healing was not the end itself. It had a greater goal. And what was that goal? Confirmation of revelation, wasn't it? We see it so many times in the Gospels, so many times in Acts. They didn't just walk around healing people in secret without anyone being affected by it in regard to their understanding of what was spoken or the person who spoke it. There was always confirmation of, Of something that was revealed. If you looked at the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, and and under this heading, Gift of the Spirit, there are two categories that he puts everything under. Gifts connected with the ministry of the Word, and then gifts connected with the ministry of practical service. That's wrong. All of them are connected with the Word. If not directly, the Word of knowledge, the Word of wisdom, prophecy, tongue speaking, indirectly, that confirms these messages. Does that make sense? And so God has a bigger purpose. And, and that really, it deals with the problem of do miracles still happen today, so on and so forth. No, they don't because it served a greater purpose to reveal God's word. And once it's confirmed there, it's confirmed from that time to out, throughout all eternity. You don't need it to be confirmed again. You've already been given the stamp of approval, um, the sign that God authored it. You don't need any more. And so when it's been completely revealed then that's what we have in chapter 13, that which is part has been done away with. So you've got for the profit of all the way that this person being healed here can help this person over here who's not being healed is because he knows that message that it's confirming is from God, and that's what's valuable to him. Does that make sense?
Okay. Um, now we get into the gifts themselves. There are nine that he mentions here. What do we know of the nature of these things listed? Some of them may seem to be, you know, common to us, but what do we know of their nature? Are they regular, everyday stuff? Miraculous gifts. So even that gifts of healing, uh, you got a good doctor you like, he's gifted in healing, perhaps in medicine. Now that's not a miraculous way. He's, he's doing something else within natural law. That's not the context here. So when you think about something like wisdom and knowledge and faith, um, those are, and even tongues. What's a tongue? Language. But what kind of language was it for the one that had that gift? Miraculous. He didn't know the language. So we're talking about miracles here. And we're talking about them for a distinct purpose. So we have uh, in our questions number two from this chapter and other sources, briefly describe the following spiritual gifts. So we'll take a stab at it. Word of wisdom. What, what did you find on that? Special ability to teach others. That's as good as I would come up with anything as well. Same with wisdom, right? And so we, we often you know, make the distinction between knowledge and wisdom, that knowledge are the facts and wisdom is a practical application of those facts. Maybe that's what it meant, but what we do know about this is that this is miraculous knowledge. It's miraculous wisdom. Um, not much else is revealed about these spiritual gifts within the New Testament, but we know that they are indeed Miraculous because they come from the spirit in this context of spiritual gifts. Knowledge, what would that be? Word of knowledge. Uh, we already talked about that. I have it backwards. So word is logos. It, it's something said. So this is a verbal communication of knowledge and wisdom, but on a miraculous level. It's something that I can't know unless I'm inspired. And notice in chapter 13, knowledge is placed right in there with prophecies and tongues, and it will vanish away. Not all knowledge vanished away, is, has it? In fact, we have what was revealed miraculously even today. So Paul makes them distinct. They seem to go hand in hand. And really what we see is uh, three different groupings. You've got uh, wisdom, knowledge as a group, faith, gifts of healings, working in miracles as a group, and then the last four, they go together as, as well. It's miraculous. That's, that's really as far as we can know. Um, Harry probably has a better explanation of it. I, I just, I, you know, it's miraculous knowledge, miraculous wisdom. Then we have faith. What can't that be? Okay. Who's he writing to? Christians. What do you have to have to be a Christian? Faith. Where does that come? Hearing by the word of God. These are things that have been given when? Think of Acts chapter 8. The apostles are sent um, there to Antioch because they had heard of conversion and the spirit had not yet fallen upon any of them. It's something that comes after the faith you already had back here. Does that make sense? We, we don't have to have some miraculous faith. We get that from studying the word of God. Anybody can have that faith. And that continues to today. And so what's been understood by most, I think, is that it's miraculous faith. Chapter 13. I better get scooting. Chapter 13, if I had faith that could remove mountains, wonder-working faith. And I think that's why it's in this same group of gifts of healings. That's self-explanatory. Working of miracles seems to be a more general thing that would just include, uh, you know, miracles. It, it may be compounded working of miracles, it's the Greek word energema, dunamis, and so maybe things like casting out of demons or raising the dead, um, maybe punitive measures of discipline through um, miracles, like in Acts chapter 13, someone hindering the work, Paul um, struck him with illness. So you have those together. Then prophecy is what? We often call a prophet what? mouthpiece of God, right? God is speaking through him. Don't ask me how that differs from knowledge or wisdom. 
I don't know. It's something that is emphasized throughout in chapter 14. Prophecy is that better gift, especially as it's with tongues. But what do you have next in discerning of spirits? What would that indicate? So in verse 3, it would indicate that we all have that obligation, but there's some miraculous way of telling that maybe not all of us have. You might note in chapter 14, he says, um, let two or three, in verse 29, chapter 14, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. Um, Let the others judge. I believe others would be the other prophets. And so I think maybe this is a gift that the prophets had in tandem with their prophecy. And you you see the same thing with tongues. Tongue is another language, but it's miraculous. And there needs to be what? An interpreter. So notice also in chapter 14 with tongue speaking in verse 27. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three. Two or three of who? Tongue speakers, right? And then each in turn, and then let one interpret. Who would one be? One of the three, right? At least that's how I read it. And so perhaps these tongue speakers also had an interpretation. But what we would take from that, at least what I would take from this, and just take this from a gra- with a grain of salt, is that another had to interpret. You don't speak and then interpret yourself. Another had to interpret. Now, if there's not another tongue speaker there to interpret, keep your mouth shut. That's an excellent point. I mean, yeah, it's not far-fetched to me that there could be something like miraculous knowledge. I, I, you know, you just don't know how necessarily that works. But certainly when they don't have the written word, that which is perfect hasn't come, something has to give, and this is God's plan. So what you see there is two categories. Either it's being revealed or what is revealed is being confirmed. And what you have is with tongues, it seems to be that they are both for revelation and confirmation Think of Acts 2, they were amazed because they each heard what was spoken in their own language. And these Galileans don't know our language. It, they were confirmed to be of God there. Plus, they were revealing the word of God. Does that make sense? All right. Um, let us finish up then with verses 12 through 14. Or just not. Um, verse 12 introduces the parallel with the human body. We know the human body is one unit, but different members, and also is Christ, those in Christ. And he demonstrates that by this baptism by one spirit. Now notice back in verse 3, he uses that concept, by the spirit of God, you said something, and you can if you're saying that Jesus is a curse, but you can if you're saying Jesus is Lord. It's, it's something we've been informed by the Spirit. And so you take that with like John chapter 3, born of water and the Spirit. I know you've heard countless sermons of how that means baptism and what the Spirit's role is in that. The Spirit revealed baptism in water for the remission of your sins. You submit to the Spirit's teaching. You're born of the Spirit and born of water because He commands water baptism. And so by one Spirit we were all baptized. That's obviously, you connect that with Galatians 3, this water baptism for the remission of sins, drinking into one spirit, we imbibe the spirit's teaching. You might make a note of John 4 with Jesus' words with the woman at the well, the water of life. In John chapter 7, John comments on Jesus' words about this water which springs up to everlasting life as having to do with the future of when the spirit would come after he's been glorified. You drink of his teaching. And so the body is not one member but many. And there's practical application to that on on Sunday. So so don't miss out on that. Uh, Don't have time for comments or questions. So appreciate your kind attention.